There we go. Good. Yep. All right. Okay, oh, now I've got a hand that I can hold the recording thing and this all in one spot, so it works out just fine. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I am Elaine. Uh, I work at Wizards. I make Magic the Gathering. Uh, I hope from your applause when he introduced me that I've got some fans in the room. Yeah. Woo! All right. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, so uh, uh, just a real quick um, background on who I am. Um, so I started working at Wizards um, almost 20 years ago. Um, my first job was indeed not the vice president of marketing. <laughs> my first job was uh, I worked on the tournament team. Um, and so I came in at the, the DCI, which was our, the group that runs the tournaments. I was the DCI tournament administrator. So I came in for my super low paying job. I moved from New York, came out here, um, and I've been there ever since. And I love it there. Um, I love it there because we are a company um, that brings people together through their shared love of games. That, that's what Wizards mission is. That's what we do. Um, we do that with magic. We do that with Dungeons and Dragons. Um, we make games, but really what we do is we forge friendships, right? That, that's what we do. We forge friendships over games. Um, so for those of you who don't know magic, which uh, hopefully there's not too many of you, but there's got to be a couple. Um, so magic was the first ever trading card game. Um, it was introduced 25 years ago. We're in our 25th anniversary right now, um, almost to the day. Like we're within like a month of when people first got their, their hands on them 25 years ago. Um, it was the first ever trading card game. And it was a complete revolution within the tabletop gaming industry because it was the first time ever that you took a deck of cards and two people didn't play with the same deck, right? So the innovation of Magic is that instead of two people playing out of the same deck of cards, there are literally 18,000 different mechanical versions of Magic cards, and you get to choose which ones you want to use and build your deck to your strategy and your play style, and you bring your deck to the table, and your opponents bring their decks to the table, and you can change them, and you can trade for new cards, and we release new cards many times a year. Um, and so it's a game that's constantly evolving and constantly changing and lets you really represent who you are, right? Um, so the thing about Magic, though, is that while it is a card game, as I alluded to before, what Magic really is is a way for people who are like-minded, who really like having fun <coughs> over playing strategy games and hanging out with their friends and competing with them and laughing with them and having clever interactions that take place on the table, fuel those friendships, right? So we have families who play together. We have people who play at Grand Prix events that have thousands of people that gather. Um, there was one just at the Seattle Center a couple months ago. I don't know if any of you went to it. Um, we have a pro tour with top level of competition. We have Friday Night Magic that happens every single week in stores around the world. Um, and these people create these lifetime friendships um, and, and even marriages. Um, there's been plenty and plenty of weddings where there's the, the magic playing friend table and they all tend to bring packs and draft instead of hang out and dance at the, uh, at the reception. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about uh, diversity, inclusivity, and harassment and bullying within games. Um, and does anybody recognize this picture? So this is a picture from the White House Summit on healthcare, specifically talking about maternity care you see a problem with that picture, <laughs> it's all dudes, right? Like, it's kind of hard to have a good decision about maternity care in a room full of all dudes, right? Um, how about this picture? That is a group, and I swear this isn't a political speech, but this is just <laughs> it's a really good picture. This is a group of the Republican interns at the House. See a problem with that? It's all white, <laughs> like all of them, right? Um, when you have groups of people that are all the same, they can't possibly help make wonderful experiences for people who aren't like them, right? And so that's the important thing about having diversity um, and inclusion in what you do. Um, so Magic's lead designer is Mark Rosewater. Um, he's been lead designer of Magic for a very long time. He is super prolific on social media. I'm pretty sure he's got a cloning machine. I don't know how he does it otherwise. Um, and he literally just answers question, like thousands of questions a day. Like I'm not even exaggerating. Um, and he gets hit an awful lot with t questions about, well, what's Magic doing about this? What's your philosophy on this? Why are you doing this? Um, and I want to touch first on kind of why it's important. Um, so uh, this user asked, um, why is Wizards trying to fix something that isn't broken, right? Uh, your game's got a majority male player base. It's pro scene. It's company staff. Um, it makes sense to have a majority of cards represent males. You always talk about if people want to see themselves in the card, but you're doing that with male representation, right? 
Um, and Mark's answer is, is pretty simple. Um, and that is that having a warped view of the world is harmful for everyone, right? It's harmful for the people who are in the majority who see themselves <coughs> reflected, and it's harmful for the people in the minority who don't see themselves reflected. Um, because it sends a message that there's groups of people who are less important, who you don't need to pay attention to, who don't even exist, right? Um, I look around this room and I see a diverse group of people. I would hate to walk into a game environment that sees just white male cis dudes, right? That's, that's not reflective of what life is. Um, and then the bit there here, this here, is that part isn't even getting into the value that's there for people to see themselves in the game. That's a super powerful thing. It's a powerful thing, especially um, if you're someone who is used to seeing yourselves places, and then to, to not have that experience of never seeing yourself, right? That, that's a super powerful thing. And whenever we do that, we get tons and tons of positive responses from the people who get to see themselves for the first time. So in your game, when you're making a game, you should be thinking about making sure that people can see themselves there. Right? You want them to see themselves there because that sends them a clear message that this is a place they belong, it's got experiences that are meaningful to them, and it's got a space where they can be. Right? So magic is lucky because, as I said before, we have 18,000 different cards, and each one of those cards has a gorgeously illustrated little box, and we have lots of room to fit in lots of different types of people and lots of places for people to see themselves. So there are buff white dudes, right? Because, I mean, buff white dudes are awesome too, right? Everybody is. Um, and we've got our, our nice angel chick there in the background, right? Um, but we also have this dude, right? This is Teferi. He's a time mage. Um, in the set that we're in right now, he's older because we went back to the plane where magic first started 25 years ago, <laughs> our time. It's been longer, Dominaria time. Um, and uh, he's aged, and there he is. We've got an elderly black guy, right? It's just a, it's a different kind of image, right? And think for a moment, how often do you see an image like this? Powerful, in control, older black man. You don't see that very often in media, let alone in games, right? Um, you want to represent people of different races. Um, the character on the right here is uh, Sahili. She's from a world that's uh, India inspired. You want to show people of different ages, right? Um, if you think about what you see in pop culture, what you see in games, everyone's kind of like, you know, 20 years old and buff, right? Like, that's what you see, right? But that's, that's not reality. That's not what human beings are. Um, you want to show different body types, right? Isn't she awesome? There was an older woman who cosplayed her in an event. It was fabulous. The hat was magnificent. It's really, really great. Um, you want to show people of different sexualities. Um, this is a, a, a couple that we alluded to first in this, this card that you see up here, this card over here. Um, this was the first time you, you saw these characters. This card didn't exist at that point. Um, and the flavor texts here talk about um, two feuding rulers who deaths were celebrated and these monuments were created to celebrate the end of their wars. Um, but in truth, they were peaceful lovers and that was just lost to the ages. Um, and then we went back and visited when that was created and actually made a card of those two characters of, the, of them themselves. Um, you want to talk about different gender identities. Um, the, uh, the character here, this one, um, is Alesha. Uh, and we put her out along with a story that talked about uh, her gender identity and her coming to terms and coming out and choosing her own name um, because she was born uh, designated male. Um, and she came out and through battle in this culture, you're allowed to choose your own name. That's how you get your real name is once you've won, won through battle. Um, and when she came out through battle, she chose the name Alesha who smiles at death. Uh, even uh, neurotypicality, right? Um, this is a character who we put out with a story uh, who is on the autism spectrum, and she thinks differently about the world and interacts with people differently, and that means that she acts differently. Family statuses, right? Like, moms can be awesome, <laughs> right? <laughs> even little babies, right? I always put that big picture out. I always put that out on Mother's Day on my Twitter. <laughs> It's funny because I get people um, who are like, oh my God, I play with that card over and over and like I never noticed the baby before. <laughs> I'm like, how could you not know the baby? She's kind of like strapped to her side. Don't piss off moms. That's, that's, that's the takeaway there. Um, and the thing about this is that you need to do it deliberately, right? Because the way things work, if you just leave it out there for people to make their own choices, you'll tend to get back overwhelmingly what you see in majority representations, right? You'll get back cis white dudes, buff people, really hot chicks, like you'll get that back most of the time, right? 
So when we go out and we commission our cards, we very intentionally make space for people to see themselves, right? So this is an art description um, that we put out for a card. Um, so the action, uh, it's a paladin who's earned high rank and commands other knights and soldiers to a beautiful African or Asian featured woman in an exquisite sweet, uh, suit of uh, plate and chain armor. Chain elements are so fine, they flow like silk, right? Um, focuses on the paladin and the mood is her knights would follow her unto death, right? So we get this sketch back, which is looking pretty good. Um, and that turns into a card that looks like that. And then, or just to clarify, yeah. that's the instruction that the artist would yes. like that would yep. from the designers? Yep, yes. Yep, so this is actually what comes from the designers, that text. Um, the way we make stuff, just as a side segue, um, is we, when we contract with artists to do things, they'll get along with that, they'll get an entire world building book, right? So what we do is we do world building, and so we have a bunch of artists who come in, and they kind of flesh out what the world looks like, what kinds of people are there, what kind of arm, uh, adornments do they have, what do they wear, Where, what does the environments look like? Um, and there's a really thick book, like this, you know, really thick, that goes out to all of our illustrators. And so they get this kind of book of background material um, that will have things in there, like like, oh, there's going to be details on her shield, like here's iconography that's in you know, the place where she lives, right? that kind of a thing. Um, and so they get that along with this kind of instruction. Um, and note, by the way, that's all the instruction they get. They get the book, and they get that. And everything else is up to the artist's imagination. We try to empower artists as much as possible, because artists, uh, we're hiring them for their creativity and for their craft. right? And we don't want to dictate to them exactly what things look like. Um, and here's another reason why it matters, right? Like, I wish I had a better photo because Kaya looks like my mom, <laughs> right? Ways for people to see themselves and people they know is amazingly powerful. Um, they get to be that in the world, and it's meaningful, right, for kids. Uh, disclosure, this, this is actually my daughter. She's a couple years older now, but that's, that's my daughter. Um, she let me borrow those goggles, but I had to give them back because they're really awesome. <laughs> Um, but then you create role models, you create spaces for people to want to live in your world and really be there. Um, so one topic uh, that I wanted to dive in and, and talk a little bit more about how magic derives what, what we do, um, and noting that every game is going to be different, and every company is going to be different, and every project you work on is going to be different. But these are the kinds of things that you should be thinking about when you're crafting imagery in your worlds, right? So I'm going to go through and talk to you a little bit about how Wizards of the Coast thinks about bodies. And it's nothing to be scared about, and it's nothing to be puritanical about, right? Like people like aspirational human forms, right? It's a good, beautiful, nice thing. Um, but how can you arrive at aspirational human forms that look powerful and awesome and kick ass, and ones that are not objectifying, right? I hope you can all see at a glance there's a huge difference between those two slides, right? Look at the women there, and look at the women there, right? Um, so how do we get there? Like, what, what kind of things do we actually think about? Because it's easy to look at those two and be like, wow, those two are totally different. One's obviously, you know, really strong and powerful, and one obviously isn't. Um, but what are the kind of notes that we think about when we talk about these things? Um, so here's an example. Um, here's two different uh, pop culture images. Um, they're both depicting a scantily clad woman, right? There she is. Um, but they're, they're, they come across very, very differently, right? Um, and if you look at the difference between the two, um, over on the left, um, we've got someone who's in a very victim pose, right? She's tied up, she's up, up, up on the post there, um, as opposed to a combatant, right? Um, one side, the, the clothing is not functional in any way, shape, or form, right? Um, Wonder Woman, though, like, I mean, it's kind of scandaly, right? But it, 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 does, it does a job, right? It's there, it, it works. Um, she can move in it. I, I saw her in the movie, it was pretty sweet. Um, uh, Red Sonia there, I've got lingerie, lingerie quotes, right? So it's, it's, it's frilly and it's, it's trying to evoke a sexuality with the actual costuming itself, um, as opposed to Wonder Woman. Uh, on one side, we've got exaggerated portions, like people's human bodies generally don't actually look like that, right? Um, and while Gal Gadot is a very aspirational human form, she's at least a real human form, right? Um, there's differences there. Um, one is hypersexualized, while one is just attractive, right? Like, she, like people can recognize that's a beautiful human. Um, one's very submissive and one's very strong, right? So you can see those kind of notes on how we compare those two things and how we think about portraying um, human bodies. Um, and you can be super uh, transparent in terms of people's body forms, right? Like there's, there's body suits, right? People wear body suits and it's very form fitting. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but there's a big difference between these two things, right? 
So if you take a look, one's uncomfortable and one's functional, right? Mystique is, is functional, right? Like she doesn't, she's not wearing stuff, but she's, she's very functional in what she's got going on. Um, one's very exaggerated in proportions, one's realistic. Um, one's uh, really hypersexualized and in this cheesecake pose, right? As opposed to someone who is attractive but in a confident, powerful pose, right? Like it's just things like that that can make a difference between uh, the way an image is received. Um, and that lets us do awesome things like this. This is Liliana, she's one of our planeswalkers, she's one of our key characters in Magic. Um, and yeah, she's showing some thigh and she's showing some midriff and she is awesome to look at, but that, she's gonna kick your ass, right? Like she is awesome and really, she's just there. Um, and it also go, it goes beyond our games, it goes beyond what's on cards, it goes, it goes into even broader um, cultural norms. Uh, for a very long time, um, this existed. Uh, does anybody know what this is? Yeah, Pirates of the Caribbean. So this is a shot of the scene in Pirates of the Caribbean in Disneyland. Um, it has been there for decades. And this is Disneyland, a family-friendly ride attraction. And as you go through it, there is a literal auction for women for wives, <laughs> right? And it's been there for decades. It's been there until I think earlier this year is when they finally closed it up, right? Like that's how long this lasted. Um, and they said, you know what, maybe that isn't the best look for our family-friendly attraction in today's day and age. Um, and so just recently, they have reopened the Pirates of the Caribbean in Disneyland. And now there is an auction, but the auction is for goods. And the auction is presided by Red the Pirate. Okay? So they took that character, and instead of being a victim, right, she's wearing very similar costuming, um, but took her from a victim role and put her into a powerful role. Um, and they even took one step further and they made her a walk around character in the park. Isn't she gorgeous? That's amazing. You're really happy about it, I could tell. <laughs> um, beautiful, right? Gorgeous. And it shows you that it's not just costuming, that isn't the point. It's not showing skin, that isn't the point. It really is showing people within context and showing them being in powerful, confident, realistic ways, not just uh, submissive, sexualized poses. Um, next bit, how am I doing on time? Good, plenty. Um, so the next bit I wanted to talk to you about was in your community, right? So I talked a little bit about in your game and how to you know, welcome people in your game, make sure people can see themselves in their game and make sure how to represent um, particularly female figures um, in a powerful, strong way in your game. Um, the other bit that you guys will have a big hand in is your community, right? The people who play your game and what does that mean for your player community, right? Because there are choices that people in the industry can make to help make communities welcoming or less welcoming. So here's a comic from uh, one of our Magic fans who, did, who does this comic a bunch called Cardboard Crack. I don't know what the crack is referring to. Even though the Magic community has made progress in recent years, there's still problems with sexism in stores that aren't friendly to women. But as players, we can make a big difference by letting people know what's not okay and calling out questionable behavior. Oh, geez, can't I just have a fun game without having to deal with all these social issues? That's the same thing I'm asking for, <laughs> right? Um, so when people want to make it a topic of conversation, it's because for them and their experiences, it is something they deal with all the time. And for the people who don't deal with it all the time, it might not seem like, you might not see it. And it might not be there for you, but just because it's not there for you doesn't mean it's not there for others, right? And what they're really asking for is to just be left alone and let them play the game. Right? That's all they want to do. They want to play your game. And as game designers, I hope you want to let them, right? <laughs> I hope you want as many people as possible to play your game and feel welcome there. Um, and to do that, you've got to make sure that the people playing your game are actually allowing other people to basically exist, right? That's, that's really what this is all about. Um, when you have really great communities, though, um, they take some of the mantle on themselves. So Magic has two completely fan-run communities. Um, one is Planeswalkers for Diversity, um, and they really go out and champion diversity issues uh, across all, all different spectrums. Um, and we have a Ladies Planeswalker Society, whose mission really is to make safe spaces for people of all genders to come and learn how to play in a way that is less intimidating, that's open and welcoming for everybody at all skill levels. All skill levels. Um, one of the things they have to deal with all the time is people are like, oh, why does there have to be a separate society just for women? It's like, no, it's not a separate society just for women. Like, this is a place where people can come and just learn how to play. And in fact, like, 35% of their members, people who show up, are actually male. But that's cool because it's welcome to everybody. But its point is that you're signaling very strongly that it's a place that's welcome for everyone. Um, so Magic has a huge uh, organized play system, as I mentioned before. Um, 
We have everything from, uh, we've got 6,000 stores around the world that run actual magic tournaments um, every week, right? They just have people come in and out. Um, some of these tournaments you can qualify for higher level events. Um, so here we've got um, uh, two women uh, who qualified. Uh, over here, um, uh, Teresa uh, is from Cincinnati. She qualified for the Pro Tour in her local store, which is really awesome. She's got that blue envelope she's really proud of. Um, Autumn here is a trans woman, and she qualified for um, the English national team last year. Um, she's the first woman on the English national team. It makes a difference who you pick to highlight, right? So it's not just who's playing your game, but as a company, who are you showcasing You know, when you stream things, when you promote things? Um, who are you putting up there so that people can see and have role models and realize that there's room for others within the community? Um, so this is a stream that we did for the launch of uh, Magic the Gathering Arena, which is the new digital game we have in development right now. It's in uh, closed beta. If you're not in it, sign up. If you just Google in Magic the Gathering Arena Beta, I'm sure you'll find the page. Um, it's about who you put up as casters, right? Um, and who's working in the company. Um, so over here, that's Melissa um, on the left. Uh, she's actually in our R&D team. She helps uh, make our wonderful cards. Uh, she's the first woman to ever top eight at a Pro Tour. Um, and then over here is uh, Maria. Uh, she actually started out running a podcast called Magic the Amateuring because she and her friend decided to just kind of chronicle her process of learning how to play and getting involved. Um, and she found the community so engaging uh, that now she actually is good enough and uh, has really good insights um, that she actually comments as one of our commentators at our, at our pro level. Um, then I wanted to show you this store. Um, so as I said, we've got 6,000 stores around the world. Um, vast majority of magic sales go through independently owned mom and pop hobby stores, right? There's a little bit, you can see it in Walmart and Target if you show up there. Um, but vast majority of our sales go through these independently owned game stores. Um, there's some wonderful ones around the Seattle area. I hope you have one near, near you that you go hang out at. Um, this one is Guardian Games. It's in Portland, Oregon. Um, and this store is one of the best stores in the world for creating new players within our organized play system. In one year, this store, this little mom and pop store, created 700 new people into our organized play system. Just this one store. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Um, and uh, the thing we know about stores is that their growth and how big their player base is and how healthy their player base is um, is fundamentally tied to who is working behind the counter. That's the number one determinator, um, is who's behind the counter. And that stores with diverse staff whether that's in gender or race or anything else, um, diverse staff equals a diverse and growing player base. Because when I walk in the door of that store, I instantly feel like, oh, this is a place I can see myself. I could be here. Like, I could hang out here. Like, I, I feel like I'm welcomed. Um, I do have to tell you, like, I, I've been playing this game for almost 25 years. I started um, within the first year Magic came out. I've, I've played on two Pro Tours myself. I was a high-level judge. I, I worked in R&D for a while. Um, and uh, I, I run the business now. <laughs> And I'll walk in the game stores around the world, and I walk in the door, and people ignore me. Uh, she must not be here, right? Like, I run this business. <laughs> this is my business. And I walk in the door, and people ignore me. I can't tell you how much that infuriates me, not just because it's my business, but because I know that means they're ignoring other people that look like me when they walk in the door. Because when I walk in the door, they think, oh, she must be in here by accident, right? And that, that, that feels really bad, right? Um, other things you can do in your community. Um, support your employees. Uh, support the community itself. Right? This is the Wizards of Coast contingent marching at the Pride Parade last year. Um, we have another contingent this year as well. Dragons and elves belong in our worlds, and so do you. I mean, fantasy of everything is so diverse. There's so much cool stuff in fantasy. To limit it to a small group of people is just crazy. Um, and the last thing I want to talk to you today about is uh, that community and what happens when bad things happen in that community. Um, so this is the first part of a statement that I unfortunately had to put out um, myself um, at the end of last year. Um, we had a situation where there's, a, there's one particular person um, who had been a Magic player who was a YouTube content creator. Um, and he started off you know, doing unboxing videos and things like that and he did that for our game and he did that for some other games. Um, and along the way, he realized that when he started picking on other people by name, um, that he got more views, he got more clicks, he got shared more, he got more followers. 
Um, and so he stopped really doing unboxing videos, and he kind of even stopped playing Magic. And instead, he just decided to just start being mean to people. Um, and he likes to spin it as, you know, people shutting down free speech or, you know, not dis disagreeing with his political stance or things like that. And uh, I want to make it super clear, but it has nothing to do with that at all. We welcome everybody. Personally, I believe that having differencing opinions is what makes America awesome. It's what makes human beings awesome. If everyone agreed with me on everything, it would be a really dull and boring world, right? Um, but it isn't a, an opinion or a political stance when you're just mean to somebody, right? When you call them out, when you make fun of them, where you paste their face on top of other bodies, right? You start making accusations about people, you know, being, being pedophiles or things with no absolute, you know, no supporting information whatsoever just to try to get clicks, right? And then when somebody gets big enough where when they make these videos, then a whole bunch of other people in our community are like, yeah, go get them. And those people start pinging the people that are called out by name. And so now those people don't just have a video out there with their face on it, you know, in a bad way, you know, being accused of things that they're not and things like that. Now they have actual hordes and legions of people coming to their social media spaces and attacking them personally and flooding them and threatening them. And just, it, just on and on and on. Um, we got to the point where one of our biggest and uh, most powerful ambassadors, um, it's a woman who's a cosplayer and a, a player, goes to all of our events. Um, she just, she said, I can't take it anymore. I just, I just can't take it anymore. And I'm gonna quit magic, I'm done. Um, and that was a, a real red flag for us, um, not because of her as an individual, right, but because our community got into a point where someone could be scared away because they just can't handle what's happening with other people interacting with them, right? It's, it was that, that powerful. Um, so this is the beginning of a statement that I made and some steps that we took um, to try to go out there. Uh, the thing about Magic is that it's tough. It's not as easy as some other games, right? Some other games, they have the options of saying, you know what, we're just not gonna have text in our game. No, no text chat, it's easy enough, right? We won't do it. Um, or we'll just ban people from our platform, right? Like we'll, we'll have you know, algorithms and reporting structures and you can ban people from the platform and kick people out of the game um, and you know, try to teach people within the game and have that happen. Um, the thing about Magic is that my platform, my game, is life. <laughs> it's the world, right? Um, when you play Magic, you play everywhere with people. Um, our community is everywhere, right? To be a part of the Magic community means being active on the internet, on social media, in these places. Um, and you can't just say, well, just don't go there, right? Because that's a part of life now, right? Like, it, can, you, can you imagine trying to get through life without being on the internet, right? Like, that's just... It's a thing that doesn't really exist, right? Um, and you certainly can't be a community leader or content creator and be in those places. Um, and so our, our options are kind of limited, right? Like I, I can't kick people out of life, um, not in any ethical or moral way anyway. Um, and um, so what do you do, right? Uh, and the best thing we can do is to come out strong and say, well, the places we control, you're not welcome here because you're not welcoming others has nothing to do with your opinions. It has nothing to do with your stances on things. You can disagree with us and our choices as much as you want. You don't have to like other people. That's also fine too. I'm not telling you have to, you know, kumbaya and get along with everyone. But you cross a line when you are actually mean to someone else, right? That, that's where the line gets crossed, right? Because that is telling people, somebody else, that, you don't, that they don't belong, right? And that's the thing that, that, that is unacceptable. Um, so we can kick you out of our places. Um, we can do we can to support people, make sure they know you know where to report things if they really feel threatened. Contact the police, you know all those kinds of things. And, and um, but at the end of the day, uh, the company saying this is what we stand for, this is what we expect out of our community, and then the community holding themselves accountable. Um, that, that's the way you can get real change. Um, by the way, at the end of all that, I was featured on Infowars. That was a great night. And then he got mad at Trump for something, and then I fell off the front page, so it was okay. <laughs> um, but I also want to show you something, you know, because when communities work well, they work really, really well. And there's so much good in the magic community. Um, there's also so much good in, in, in my sister brand, Dungeons & Dragons, in the Dungeons & Dragons community. Um, Dungeons & Dragons, uh, as, as I hope you know, um, was the, the first ever role-playing game. It's 40 years on compared to my measly 25. Um, and uh, it's had a real great resurgence the last couple of years. Um, it's actually bigger today than it ever has been. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the wonderful um, communities and content that are being created by people going out and streaming and um, having a real fun time, um, coupled with you know Stranger Things, because that was awesome. Um, but this is what happens 
when a community does it right. Um, so this past weekend, uh, just this past weekend, uh, there was a whole streaming event that happened over the weekend. There was a lot of Hollywood people. There was like the big show, the wrestler, the big show was in like playing D&D on screen with folks. Like that's crazy, right? Um, and it was a huge big stream event uh, and the public was able to come in and like meet these celebrities that are doing streaming um, and uh, participate and put that out there. Um, and this thread popped up. Um, and this, this woman uh, was moved to write this. Um, talk about why she loves D&D so much. I went into the weekend convinced I wasn't meant to be there, that I didn't belong. But as a black woman, I enter a lot of spaces and faces being immediately questioned, and face being immediately questioned. I'm often met with suspicion and derision upon arrival, looked at as someone that must have wandered in by mistake. And I'm so used to that feeling, that feeling of being other. This weekend was one of the first times in my life when I was truly able to just exist. I was greeted by every person as an equal, friend, and colleague on my arrival. I spent so much of this weekend overwhelmed with happy tears and emotions, surrounded by D&D family. I talked tonight with a bunch of other folks about how amazing it was to allow to be. I spent this weekend feeling the full freedom of having the space to be completely who you are, to be surrounded by people different from different backgrounds that just respect each other and do so completely is so jarringly beautiful. My soul is so happy right now and it feels amazing. Thank you to every single person that spoke to my heart with your kindness this weekend. I am so grateful, honored, and blessed to be a part of this community. Thank you for having me exactly as I am. And then the last thought I have for you, and then I'll open it up to some questions if you guys have some questions, um, is uh, this post from Mark again. Um, so this person asked, by the way, I think that's the same person who asked the previous one, wasn't it? Uh, in ongoing representation efforts by wizards, left-handed midget serial killers, by the way, I don't think the appropriate word is midget, um, were born in Croatia, named Steve, seem to be left out. When is the discrimination going to end? So I, I get that you're trying to mock diversity and inclusion, but I think it comes from an ignorance of what it feels like to be excluded. When you've lived your life in the majority, it's easy to take it for granted that you see yourself represented in the products and entertainment that you use. But every time we branch out, and I'm not exaggerating, every time, and represent a new segment of people, I get heartfelt messages from them about how much it means to see themselves in the game. The reason Wonder Woman and Black Panther have been such cultural touchstones is because it's allowing new groups of people to experience something they've never experienced before. I get that it's easiest to mock that when it's something so basic to your experience that you don't even realize it's a thing you would miss if you didn't have it. But I beg for you to try to see life through other people's perspectives, just as I always talk about how good designers see the game through different players' perspectives. Try to take actions that build the world up and make it a better place for everyone, then tear it down for others to make your world better in comparison. There you go, that's my presentation. <laughs> Anybody have questions? Yes. Yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> um, so we actually have a couple. Actually, um, um, I'll pop up that um, gender identity slide. Give me if you give me a second. <laughs> Yeah. There we go. Okay, so we actually have so the, so we have we have two actually uh, now, which uh, isn't nearly enough, but it's a start, right? Um, the first we came out with is, is uh, that amazing person there. Um, that's Ashiok. Um, Ashiok was uh, was very specifically not put out with a gender and not put out with any kind of identity, um, and uh, is just amazing. Um, and then uh, this is Hellar. Um, who came out in our most recent set, um, Dominaria. Um, so I'll read that there for because anybody can't read it. Um, born on the night of a legendary negotiation between two groups of Lenoir elves, Halar uses a genderless elvish pronoun that reflects their ambiguous identity. Halar's carefully controlled fire magic, unique among the Lanoirs, burns in their fiery arrows in the eyes of their bonded Kavu, Sereni. The Kavu is a big beastie, fantasy beast type character. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Yes? Where are some of your offices? Like, uh, you said you had stores.
offices and shops and bases all around the world? Yeah. Or yeah, we do. Um, so our offices, our main headquarters are in Renton, um, just right down uh, five down in Renton. Um, and then uh, we are part of Hasbro. Uh, we're part of the Hasbro family. We're a wholly owned subsidiary. Um, Hasbro's headquarters are back in Rhode Island, but they do very little um, with magic back over there. Um, but we do have a lot of global offices, um, and our global offices tend to be baked into the Hasbro offices around the world. Um, so our other major offices are like um, in, in outside, right outside of London, in Sydney, um, in Japan, in Tokyo, um, in Singapore, in um, like so we have lots and lots of offices around the world. But right down the street in Renton, so when you're graduated, check out our job pages. <laughs> Good. Any other questions? Oh man, no one's gonna ask me about the reserve list? Yes. <laughs> I know some of you got that. <laughs> All right. each other, you know, we're all, we're all a family, we're a tribe, and we really appreciate the, the mindset of Wizards of the Coast right here in Seattle. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, everybody.